I guess by 63, we were um, pretty confident that we had developed the science that would allow us to, to eradicate uh, segregation in that it was uh, incongruent uh, you know, with the basic tenet of our Constitution. So, you know, as I hear that statement, the statement that Wallace made that uh, well, segregation is forever, uh, we had tested uh, the science of nonviolence in other cities and we knew that it was comparable and competent to deal with that problem. What made Birmingham a city to focus on? Birmingham um, had a reputation equal to the Mississippi Delta in terms of its brutalization of people. Uh, it was known for its uh, uh, Bull Connor, its police department, its uh, violation and bombing and um, denigrating black people. And it was a very resistant uh, city. Clan, a lot of clan activity, a lot of uh, suppression. And so um, that made it uh, special because the, the greater the resistance in the application of the the uh, science of nonviolence, the clearer the issues become for the onlooker. So are you saying that in order for nonviolence to work, it has to be met with violence? No, I said that it, it, it crystallizes when uh, um, it's like uh, contrast. And you have a better uh, means of showing and revealing and uh, bringing out the contradiction when there's an adamant attitude in people about uh, superimposing uh, their attitudes upon other people so that you get a better contrast when you have uh, people who are very adamant about that. You've talked about the oppression of a city like Birmingham, Bull Connor's reputation and things like that. I want to move forward to the point where you decided to involve children. I mean, if it was such an oppressive environment, wasn't that kind of risky to involve children? Well, in terms of the, uh, the nature of the situation, because of the intense uh, suppression and the conditioning of the adults, it was necessary to use uh, children because children had not been indoctrinated into that kind of uh, uh, violence and suppression. Uh, so they could come on the, on the situation with a, and a, a fresh approach. Uh, but it wasn't particularly dangerous from our point of view of using children. At that particular point, children were in Vietnam. Guy 17 was in Vietnam. And our thinking was that if a young person can go to Vietnam and engage in uh, war, then the person certainly uh, same age and younger could engage in a nonviolent war that didn't violate the constitution of the people and our property and that uh, when you use that method the chances of getting injured is very very little anyway okay you mentioned children 17 being in vietnam you were actually dealing with children who were much younger than that yeah we were dealing with children six and uh, those who um, took the position that they well, wanted to involve themselves, that they themselves understood the nature of love and its power and wanted to demonstrate that love and its power, then we permitted them to uh, become involved. Let me back up just a little bit. You talked about the indoctrination of adults. What was the adult thinking? Because I know that you had many of the black leaders involved with the demonstrations, but what did the population in general feel? Well, they felt that segregation would probably, the, in, in 63 in Birmingham, most adults felt that segregation was um, permanent, that it was just that way, that uh, that was a permanent system. It would probably be that way, that the power of the city, the power of the state, the power of the Congress, the Marines, the Army, the Air Force, they see all that as alignments of power, uh, and they saw it as an impossible situation. And so most of the adults felt that nothing like that could change, probably ex except that Russia or China invaded and destroyed America or something like that. But people didn't think that there was a force or a power within the country strong enough to offset something as entrenched and as reinforced as segregation. Yeah, the, the um, well in Alabama in 63, the fear was entrenched because the people had come out of a, a social system wherein they had no way to uh, redress any of their grievances, lynchings, bombings, uh, so that there was a tendency not to do anything that would aggravate uh, or cause state violence to be heaped upon the people. So that, that they had a conditioning, and so you had to get people who had not experienced all of that and who had uh, confidence in themselves and in, the, the, uh, in our system of law. Well, the young people were susceptible to that principle that uh, 
that the attitudes and uh, opinions of white people did not constitute law. That was simply tradition and custom, and that we had to live according to the New Testament and the Constitution. And if we did, then we would uh, uh, forge in law rather than having to live by the attitudes and opinions of the people, of the dominant people in that, at that point. Okay, but if the people, if the adults were so fearful, it seems to me that you become kind of a Pied Piper in a way of taking these children away. I can't believe the parents were supportive of their children getting involved with you. Well, it was. Uh, we had uh, workshops and we had mass meetings. Um, well, it was good. Um, a lot of the adults would come out. One of the things that we were interested in is getting uh, the American uh, black community involved. And in a city like Birmingham, you can't hardly go to a church, say, in Chicago, where there's not a member in that church that is not related to Birmingham. So if you put several thousand children from Birmingham, uh, say, in jail, you've sort of affected the religious community in Cleveland, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati. So you wanted to get the black community involved, and we wanted to get the black community in Birmingham involved. And the way you get people involved is get their children involved. A lot of people are afraid to come to mass meetings in terms of the... Uh, Alabama Bureau of Investigation would be around taking pictures and harassing people. So when the children became involved, they became involved, which meant that they started coming to workshops and mass meetings. And our position was, rather than trying to get your children out of the movement, join the movement with your children, that uh, the reason we had a, a, was faced with segregation because they themselves hadn't assumed the responsibility to uh, breaking the uh, attitudes and the patterns of uh, misbehavior say from their parents and if the students didn't break those patterns then they would live a life of uh, uh, degeneracy in that kind of state so so it was like the parents uh, pretty much agreed with that and, and most parents even when it's dangerous and risky they have a deep uh, sense of appreciation and respect for young people when they're doing what's right I mean all of them knew it was potentially dangerous but they knew it was honorable and they knew it was noble and they knew it was right so they, they didn't fight it against it and then you had myself and Fred Shuttleworth Abernathy and Martin King preaching, and it's very difficult to uh, to uh, go against the logic and the reasoning of a preacher who is really in the, in the about the business of preaching. You know. All right, uh, let's just go on. Tell me, tell me a story about what it was like when you started to train all those children. You had thousands of children that you were trying to train. There must have been some funny incidents that came out. Tell me a story. Well, what happened? Um, um, I had come out of the Nashville movement and the Mississippi movements where we had basically used young people all the time. And, uh, well, at first King didn't want me to use young people because I had 80 charges of contributing to the delinquency of minor, minors against me in Jackson, Mississippi for sending young people on the Freedom Ride. Well, uh, there was about 5 to 10, 12 people would go on demonstrations each day. And my position was, well, you can't get the dialogue you need with a few people. Besides, most adults have bills to pay, house notes, rents, car notes, utility bills, but the young people, wherein they can think at the same level, are not at this point hooked with all those responsibilities. So a boy from high school, he get the same effect in terms of being in jail, in terms of putting pressure on the city as his father, and yet he's not, there's no economic threat on the family because the father's still on the job. So the strategy was, okay, let's use thousands of people who won't create an economic crisis because they're off the job. So the high school students was, was like our choice. And we brought that to them in terms of um, you, you're adults, but you're still sort of living on your mamas and your daddies. So it is your responsibility in that you don't have to pay the bills uh, to take the responsibility to confront the segregation question. And what we did, we went around and started organizing, say, like the, the queens of the high school, the basketball stars, the, um, the, the football stars. The, so you get the influence and power leaders involved. And then... They, in turn, uh, got all the other students involved because it was only about, like I said, 15 people a day demonstrating was willing to go to jail because the black community did not have that kind of cohesion in terms of a camaraderie. People knew each other, but only in terms of on their way to jobs, on their way to church. But the students, they have sort of a community they'd been in for, say, 10, 11, 12 years since they were in elementary school. So they had bonded well. So if one went to jail, that was a direct effect upon another, one because they was classmates. Whereas parents, people living in the community, do not have that kind of closeness. So the strategy for using the students was to 
to get the whole environment, to help them overcome the crippling fears of dogs and jails, and, and to help them start thinking through problems on, the, on their feet. To think through a living problem causes you to think, wherein if you're just reading books and referring, but once you get involved, you have to think. Okay, now you're telling me a lot of the philosophy, but what, what when you brought these kids together, did you have, the, I know there's a story in here somewhere of what happened when you finally said, okay, I need some good volunteers here. What? Well, the first thing we did, we got to, there's a film, the Nashville City in story, I don't know whether you've seen it or not, it's NBC White Paper. We would show that film at all of this, uh, at all of the uh, schools. And one of the things that I was, I guess the difference that, uh, that we approached was that you are responsible for segregation you and your parents, because you have not stood up. In other words, our position was that according to the Bible and the Constitution, no one has the, uh, has the power to oppress you if you don't cooperate. So then if you say you are oppressed, then you are also acknowledging that you are in league with the oppressor. Now, it's your responsibility to break league with the oppressor. If you don't second his motion on what's wrong, his motion on what's wrong will die, and you make a motion in terms of what's right and second your own motion and that motion will become alive. So it was like, as long as you go along with segregation, you second Bull Connor's motion. So don't second his motion, put your own motion on the floor. The fact that schools and business shouldn't go on as usual as long as you're involved in being oppressed okay, and violent. Tell, tell me what the kids did. How did they respond? To this? They responded uh, beautifully. Uh, your first response is like the young women. Uh, I guess um, from about 13 to 18, they're probably more responsive in terms of courage, confidence, and the ability to follow reasoning and logic. Um, so nonviolence to them, uh, it's logical that you should love people, you shouldn't violate people, you shouldn't violate property. There's a way to solve all problems without violating. It's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, it's an uh, immediate threat upon you. However, if you maintain your position, the threat goes away. So that kind of logic fits uh, very well with young people who are not engaged in a... Okay, uh, so young girls, 13 To so, 18. They were pretty good. Who is the next group to respond? Then the elementary students. Uh, um, they can comprehend that. And of course, I guess the last guys to get involved, mo most of them was finally got involved in the high school guys or the last days because the, the brunt of the violence in the South is directed toward the young males so that the females do not uh, experience that kind of negative violence say from the white males as readily as they, the, the young black males did. So they didn't have the kind of uh, immediate fear, say, of white policemen as the young men did. So their involvement was more spontaneous and upfront than, say, the, the guys. Now, say in a, a nonviolent movement, I think the, King makes a statement that it's not like punching a bunch of buttons and you get automatic response. People with all their frailties make up the, the, the matrix of a movement. Um, so if you have a philosophy, you have in any movement all the divergent attitudes and emotions and uh, people bring all their problems with them. And so you don't, in a, in a, say a movement dynamic, have the absolute discipline. What you have, you have the spirit of discipline. Okay, okay, but you're giving me philosophy again. I want to know what the kids did. Did they run down the street? Did they run around the cops? Did they do something like that? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, see, well, all of that was like, uh, all of that was part of within the tactical scope of what you're doing. In other words, um, none of them got outside the law in terms of what they were doing. They. Uh, I'm uh, not suggesting that. I'm saying I'm that, suggesting. Said, let's say like when we had the demonstration, uh, um, a, a demonstration plan, we'll call it blitz. Okay, we say, okay, now, we, we're going down this street, and you're going to be confronted by the police. Now, while these people are being conf confronted by the police, we want these groups of students to go around the police or go down the streets and wind up downtown because we want all of you downtown. Now, in downtown, um, you had not just mourning, praying people. You had students being students, singing, uh, jovial, walking through stores, singing, um, but you didn't have nothing in terms of out of the ordinary. Because, um, I have to tell the story from my experiencing and how I was uh, experiencing people and what they were doing in my environment. And I'm sure that based on um, me running nonviolent workshops and students seeing me as a nonviolent teacher, their conduct around me probably would be different, say, if they was around the street in the, in the corner of the cellar. But in relationship to my experience in, in the young people, in particular in all of the confrontation processes in Birmingham, I would say that I had, uh, 
I had not met even the, 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 I mean, the Nashville students who was on a college level, did not manifest the kind of maturity and strength of character as those young people in Birmingham. So that, that, that I think that's, that, that is what is phenomenal about that movement, that you had the total high school population operating at a highly internal discipline, not in terms of external forces, but internal discipline than any, any movement I've seen. And I'm sure that, like I said, children are children. They act, young people act like young people, and they didn't always go around acting like, you know, monks or anything like that. But, uh, but in terms of, just in terms of respect and uh, decorum. Um, How does a six-year-old girl respond in the midst of something like this? Well, that particular girl that you would see a picture in, that say, the Martin Luther King book on Why We Can't Wait, that, that little girl came to me and said, uh, uh, I, I want to demonstrate. I said, well, you're too little, and uh, besides, you'd have to understand Jesus Christ and God and all that stuff, and I said, you got to be born again. She said, well, I, I've been born again. I'm a member of a church, and I've been baptized. I said, well, I still think you're too little, and her mama said, well, she's been thinking about it, and she's not too little. She goes to Sunday school, Sorry. and she goes to Sunday school, and she's, uh, she lives out her conviction in my position. Well, if you, if you understand what the cross is about and you don't have no problem with getting killed and you don't have no problem going to jail and uh, you understand that you can't sue nobody because this is something you take up on yourself, if that's the way you feel, if you feel about it like I do, then you can get involved. A photograph of you, Reverend Bevel, where uh, you were using a policeman's bullhorn to talk to some children because I think they started to misbehave one day. I think, I wonder if you could tell us that story. Um, yeah, that was the time I was... I was referring to that we were coming off a demonstration and the police was using, was driving the students back with water and dogs. And when we got back to the church, a lot of the adults had come out of the community and was watching. Now the students was, was being playful and jovial and, and mocking the police, but the adults, upon seeing a lot of the students knocked down by um, the water and, and the clothes torn off by dogs began to organize their guns and knives and bricks. And what I did, actually, was, uh, was tell the students that they had to respect police officers and that their job was to help police and that uh, to keep order, and that the police was there to keep order, and that uh, the people who was there probably throwing was probably paid as instigators, and therefore we had to watch them. And it was like, it's very effective. Uh, it started all the students to uh, pointing at adults who had rocks and knives and guns, and then the adults had to stop dropping them, and uh, because it would have started a riot, and the riot would have gotten off the issue. And I think that the students were very aware of that, and the adults weren't aware of that. So what we did, we got the adults that day, say, maybe nearly a thousand, to go into the church, to to go through uh, the reason why you don't use violence, and the fact that we were in control, and that we were. Uh, gaining because we were not using violence because the issues were being made clear. But uh, that, that was like a, one of the spectacular events that, that you, you got this policeman with a bullhorn not knowing what to do with it and I said, well, where's Bull Connor? And uh, it was like, he, he said, uh, well, he started looking for him. I said, well, let me use your bullhorn. So he just g gave it to me. So when I took the bullhorn and said, okay, get off the streets. Now, we're not going to have violence. If you're not going to respect policemen, uh, you're not going to be in the movement and, uh, you know, so it was it's strange, I guess, to them. I'm with the police talking through the bullhorn and giving orders, and everybody was obeying the orders. <laughs> it was like, it was wild. But, but, but what, I, what was at stake was the, the possibility of a riot, and that uh, once in a movement, once a riot break out, you have to stop. It takes you four or five more days to get reestablished, and I was trying to avoid that kind of situation. You ever have a run-in with Bull Connor? Yep, I, uh, one day, uh, we, I'd been out on a demonstration since 8 that morning because the kids would come in, instead of going to school, they'd come to the church, say, about 6.30 on, and I'd start doing workshops. So I hadn't had any food or any water, so the police was out all that morning also. So there was a lieutenant, so I said, well, look, man, uh, I don't want to leave him out here because all these kids out here, so can I get some food off the truck? So he said, yeah, just get in line with, the, with my men. <laughs> So by that time, Bull Connor came up and saw me in the line, and he started screaming. He said, get that nigga. So he eating up the city's food. <laughs> so the lieutenant said, I told him he could get the food. He cannot have the city. I mean, he just went into a rage. And it was interesting because that's the point at which he actually lost control uh, of his policeman, that when he carried on like that, and the lieutenant was saying, no, 
uh, Reverend, you can have the sandwich. And Bull Connor was saying he cannot have the sandwich. The lieutenant said, I told him he could have the sandwich. And it was like it was a, it wasn't really between me and Bull, it was between Bull and his lieutenant. And so I said, well, Mr. Connor, if you, you know, don't think I should have your food, you can have your food back. No, Lou said, no, you can eat the food. And it was like, you know, something that simple and petty that the lieutenant was really, was really pushed in terms of seeing how petty he was and how, um, how, uh, Negative he was about something that small, but but that was to me a, a great day of, of confrontation in terms of put he and his men, you know, and my my eating the sandwiches. I was uh, on my way to Sunday school. I was in uh, Edington, North Carolina. Uh, I had gone up to work with uh, Golden Franks, who was our North Carolina and Virginia field secretary. So I was on my way to Sunday school, and uh, I was preaching that Sunday, and I heard about it over the radio. And what was your reaction when you heard? Well, my first reaction when I heard about the bombing was uh, anger, rage. Uh, um, I felt that the bombing of the church was almost like a personal insult, that we had used the church and the young people. And I was feeling that the, the reactionary forces or the Klan or whoever was trying to teach us a lesson. And it was like, uh, I guess I experienced more or less as an insult than an injury. And uh, then I got information to the effect that some of the guys who was involved in it was from the uh, sheriff department. And then I was thinking about uh, killing people. And then I had to do a lot of thinking about that. And that's when I started thinking about uh, what would be the appropriate response to that kind of situation. Now, I get the sense that that was very often how you handled things, that you would feel that base reaction and then you would think it through and, and bring out something of a higher level from it. Is that something you did often during this time? Yeah, I, I think that one of the, um, uh, I think it's natural for human beings to get angry when there's an intense violation. And I think if a person don't have the capacity to get angry, I don't think they have the capacity to think fully through uh, the implications of that which caused them to be angry. Um, so I've always had the, felt that I had a right to be angry and express uh, my real feelings about that. No, I did not feel that to carry out a conduct that's uh, as demeaning to a person as, uh, as the person that carried out was necessarily correct. Under the nonviolent Christian thing is, okay, what you do is you relax and then you work through the cause and then address the cause. But basically when something like that happened, my first response is to get angry and want to kill somebody. Now, Andy Young has told us that uh as a result of the 16th Street Church bombing, you and Diane Nash came up with the whole idea for the, the Selma campaign. Uh, if that's true, could you tell us how, how you thought that through? Yeah, well, we were dealing with, uh, well, if the sheriff was involved in that and the, the, the deputy sheriff was involved in that, then the way we can stop the bombings is to give the black people the option to put sheriffs and irresponsible lawmakers and law enforcing agents out of office since they are elected by the people. So rather than being mad and asking for Kennedy to send the army down and those kinds of things, let's take to the people, since all of the people are angry and all the people feel the shock of this uh, violation, let's take to the people a strategy and a plan for working on the right to vote. And what was interesting, all of the people bought into it, but the leaders had problems with it. When you say leaders, who do you mean? Um, the NACP people, the Urban League people, the, the AME people, the core leadership, um, uh, and in fact some of the people in SCLC like Shuttlesworth, uh, they had problems with it because it, it demanded a new um, commitment, it, man, it, it demanded an environment, it, it demanded that we become engaged in the confrontation over the question of the right of black people to vote. And I think that all of them was aware that most of the violence perpetrated on and toward black people was specifically for the purpose of disenfranchising them. So they felt that if we moved in that direction, we would probably reap a whole lot of violence uh, unprecedented. Okay, okay based that. on what you were telling me, I sense that uh, compared to Birmingham and similar campaigns, Selma was a whole new way of thinking. If that's true, would you expand on that a little bit and tell me about the difference? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Um, the other movements had uh, based, uh, uh, was focused on public accommodations, 
the, the right of a person to eat, the right of a person to uh, a ride the bus, and the right of the person to use the theater. Um, the Selma movement was to address the specific problem of disenfranchisement, uh, which was different in terms of it wasn't asking for an accommodation, it was asking for a basic constitutional right. It was addressing the violation of a basic constitutional right, which is the right to vote. My thinking on that was that the American people would be more responsive to that than, say, the right to eat or the right to ride a bus, because that is more basic in terms of uh, an American principle, the right to govern yourself. That's very basic. There was a lot of debate and argument as to whether people uh, would respond to that. Uh, my position on it was that if you uh, clar clarify for people in terms of uh, the need to vote, people understood that. The problem was that they didn't see a way or means by which that could be accomplished. Um, I think once we showed uh, that that was possible, if they wouldn't re settle for nothing less, see, the question becomes what's possible? What's possible is what you want, what's, what's yours is right for you to have if you don't settle for nothing less. And, and the point was then getting people to agree to settle for nothing less than that because there was no rational reason why any segment of the population should be denied the right to govern themselves. And it was, it was pretty easy to sell the people on that. In terms of uh, Selma, do you think that was one of the best organized campaigns that was part of the whole civil rights movement? I would say that in terms of, uh, yeah, it's probably more classical and uh, better, probably thought out better. Um, if you study it in terms of Chuck Fagel's book or in other books, I think you'll find that the application and the response is probably uh, um, more accurate. I think it's because it's constitutional, constitutionally clearer. I think there's a lot of uh, growth and discipline in the people who were involved. Um, and I think the need was uh, clearer and, and, and necessary. And I think that's, that's why it was maybe more of a classical movement than the other movements. The movement does seem to be a little bit older and a little bit more sophisticated by the time you get to Selma. Is that how you see it? Or what, what was the basis for the, all that sophistication? Uh, experience. Um, Give me a sentence on that. Um, the, th that which would allow us to be more accurate, to, uh, more confident, more secure in the application of nonviolence grew out of our experience in, experiments in Nashville, Albany, Savannah, um, Danville, Virginia, um, Birmingham, Greenwood, Macomb, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, Nashville, the Freedom Ride. I had gone through all of these campaigns uh, when I got to Selma. So, you know, it's like playing ball. Um, you are competent based on the application and the response and your ability to apply the principle. So that people were, were, were trained, they were accustomed to violence, they were not afraid, and they were, at this point, uh, comfortable with the principles and application of nonviolence. Okay. Um one of the things that happened, of course, another time when you took a sad moment and came up with a moment of um, victory, or at least a, a way of achieving victory, was after Jimmy Lee Jackson was, was uh, killed. Um, I think you, that was when you came up with a very important idea. Well, um, Jimmy Lee Jackson's death came at a point when I was recovering from pneumonia in a, a beating I had taken myself and not calling off demonstrations in Selma. Um, so James Orange came and told me that uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson, James Orange was a member of our staff who was in charge of Marion, Alabama, and he came and told me that uh, this guy, Jimmy Lee Jackson, a young deacon in, in uh, Marion, Alabama, had been shot, and of course a few days later uh, he died. I, I was getting out of the hospital myself, so I asked him what was the situation. He said, well, the people are mad and they're going to, they want to riot. But I think what, what a, a significant thing that happened during the period in which Jackson was killed the state troopers had gone to Marion and had beat up all of the newsmen and had destroyed their cameras, tore up their pads, and ran them out of town. So for the first time, the local and national press really started focusing in on the on police violence and brutality. And it was that night that Jimmy Lee Jackson was, was killed. Well, when I went up, I had to uh, preach because I had to try to get the people back out of the state of negative violence and out of a state of grief. Now, if, if, if you don't deal with negative violence and grief, it turns into bitterness. So what I recommend was that the people walk from uh, Marion to Montgomery, which would give them time to work out 
in terms of with energy and thinking through their hostility and resentments and get back focus on the issue. And the question I put to them, do you think Wallace sent the policeman down to kill the man or do you think that the, in the, in, out of the pressures and the fears that the police overreact? I said, now if the police overreact, then you can't go around assuming that Wallace sent the man down to kill. So what we need to do is go to, go to Montgomery and ask the governor, what is his motives and intentions? And did he do that deliberately? And was that, in fact, just an error that took place? And so the people agreed to do that. You know, it's like, let's, let's further investigate. And my point with the people was, I, you know, I don't have no problem with shooting people necessarily. But before you shoot people, at least you ought to have all the facts as to what happened so that you're acting rationally upon the law, so that you're not just indiscriminately going around mad, killing some white people that may be coming down the street. If the governor sent the man down here to kill a man and you know that, then if you want to deal with the governor on violence, then you have the information. But first of all, do all your investigations and your analysis before you take an action. And the people agreed to that. So then they agreed to walk from Selma to uh, Montgomery to see the governor. Was Dr. King supportive of the idea? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, in, in the nonviolent movement, if you went back to some of the classical strategies of Gandhi, when you have, um, say, uh, a, a great violation of the people and there's a great uh, sense of injury, you have to give people a honorable means and context in which to express and eliminate that grief and speak decisively and succinctly back to the issue. Otherwise, your movement will break down in violence and, and chaos. So, so agreeing to go to Montgomery was that kind of tool that would absorb a tremendous amount of energy and effort, and it would uh, keep the issue of disenfranchisement before the whole nation. And the whole point was of walking from Selma to Montgomery, it'd take you five to six days, and which, which would give you the time to discuss in the nation um, through the, the papers, radio, television, and going around speaking what the real issues were. So it was like, we need time to educate all of America to this problem. And by walking from Selma to Montgomery, that would give us the five or six days we need to address the nation. And while you were walking, were you aware of what was going on in Washington through all this? Oh, yeah. We, how, how did you stay in touch with it? Tell me about it. Well, we, uh, well, we had Walter Funtroy, uh, who was in charge of our Washington office, and then we had Governor Collins, I think he was ex-Governor Collins then, but who was like an emissary or something for, for, uh, for Johnson, who stayed on the scene all the time. And then you had the Justice Department guys who was on the scene all the time. So um, whenever you have a movement going of that proportion, we were always uh, in immediate communications with the uh, Justice Department and the executive branch of the government. Just before the march started, of course, uh, President Johnson was on na national television addressing a joint session of Congress and uh, made the, uh, the immortal line, uh, we shall overcome. And uh, how did that make you feel when, when you heard President Johnson use that line? Well, I don't think it was that line particularly that really set me off. I think it was the, I don't know whether you read the whole speech, uh, but in my estimation, that speech, uh, I think it's t entitled now, we shall overcome, I, I would suspect in, let's, in my ratings, if I was to rate a civil rights speech of the 60s as the most potent, um, um, best speech, I would give that speech the, um, the, the number one place. I read the whole speech. I think it's a classical, in terms of a man rising above being a southerner, being white, and being anything, and just in that moment uh, was possessed by the spirit of being man, looking at America, looking at the Constitution, looking at the struggling people. And I think there was a genuine sense of love and respect that went from Johnson to all people. And I think it's very clear in that speech that it is not a political speech, it's more or less a sermon. And uh, it, it was the same effect that I get when I hear good preaching. It's, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, this guy's really saying it and he's, he's not playing. And because he is saying it and because he is not playing, something is going to be done. And it was like, that's the law, that the president is speaking, he is not politicking, he's very serious about what he's saying, and people hear him, and they know that he is right, and they're going to address the problem. And it was like, uh, yeah, well, the movement, that movement is, is solved. Yeah, that's, we've solved the problem. <laughs> what do you remember about Jim Clark? <laughs> well, uh, big, 
<laughs> Jim Clark, big, threatening. Um, Jim Clark was, um, was like a typical reactionary uh, Southern sheriff, who in fact is interesting. He, uh, I used to see him all the time because he was dating a black woman that was lived about a block from the church, so his car would be over to our house, like when daybreak, you know. And, uh, and, and everybody understood that, and that's typical. See, that's typical of the uh, reactionary Southern uh, white sheriffs. Um, uh, his whole power base was based on the disenfranchisement of people and intimidating people. He had a posse of about 300 people, and he would ride around in motor cage with his posse and threatening folk and this kind of thing. And uh, he was a sheriff of the county. And Wilson Baker was a um, was a the, was a what they call a, a city um, safety commissioner, I think. And of course, he was from North Carolina. And what had happened? He had married a woman from Selma, but he was a very um, well-trained police officer. In other words, he had a a concept of what police work was under a democratic system of government in terms of upholding the law. And of course, his position was that in that that was a science that a man who had studied and mastered that science could be impartial in the enforcing of the law. And that's all he was interested in. And he used to sit down to me and talk about, you know, hours about police work and police enforcement and all that kind of stuff. And on the other hand, that was Jim Clark, who was a sheriff, who was negative, uh, threatened if you didn't act frightened around him, demanded that you, uh, you know, get down for him, and all that, those, those kind of antics. And of course, when you come around and act just like a man, he would just, he would go off. He would go off. Like when he jumped on Vivian, I mean, that was a problem that day. You know, he couldn't get Vivian to act cowardly. And when a black man didn't act cowardly around him, he just, he went off. And, uh, um, but he basically didn't know police work. Um, he had based, uh, you know, like the little fiefdoms in that you read about in, in history. And he was, he reminded you more or less of the guys, I don't think you ever knew them, the sheriffs down in New Orleans, not New Orleans, but in Louisiana. I mean, they was pretty much like Jim Clark. They had little kingdoms, and they had these little armies. Well, um, when, when you first heard about Emmett Till, did, did that make a very strong impression upon you? Yes. Um, when I first heard of Emmett Till, I think I was in, the, I, in Cleveland or the Navy. Uh, I remember that era. It's about 55, 54-ish. And... Um, well, I'm from Itabina, Mississippi, and the next county is Sunflower County in Ruval. So it's uh, the gin uh, fan belt, the, the fan that they put on his body came from a gin, uh, the Gibson gin right in Itabina where I came from. So it, it, it had a, a real effect upon me in terms of uh, that kind of South had to be changed and had to be dealt with. But uh, I, I remember that very vividly in terms of how it affected me and how it affected all the people around me. You were involved in very many campaigns. You've told us about quite a few of them today. Was there a time where you felt like you were really part of something that was big, something that was could be called a movement, rather than just being a person, that individual that was out there fighting alone? Did, and you really felt like you were part of a large movement at the time. Yeah, well, I was uh, of the impression that uh, the movement was a, an act of God in history, uh, and that I was simply one of the persons that he had called forth to be involved in it. And I, I saw it uh, comparable to the Moses movement out of Egypt, um, um, I, any of the movements of that proportion, that here was a people who had been uh, oppressed and that they were going to change that condition and that that is an act of God and that, uh, that you have to be faithful to God in order to get him to do that. See, cause it's, see the proposition is you ask God to remove the oppressor because you're not going to kill the oppressor. Well, in order to get him to do that, you got to do what he said do. So I, f I felt myself a part of the, the God movement, a historical church movement, that it's the church, it's God moving in history, eliminating oppression and war and all that, and I'm a part of that. Was there any particular time when you felt like you saw that or understood that as some event that really triggered it inside you? Yeah, I... Um, um, I guess I started uh, that kind of feeling whenever King, King spoke, uh, when I first heard King speak and when I started he hearing him and listening to him when he would come to Nashville, that it was obvious to me that he was not motivated by, say, political ambition, that his motivation was altruistic and uh, theological, and that 
it was scientifically correct. And that uh, when a person is scientifically correct and what they're doing is not designed to injure anybody uh, and it's designed to help everybody, then it has to be motivated by God because the individual motivation is selfish. Okay, so when I say, now, he's not doing this for money, he's not doing this for reputation because he mess around and get killed, right? So he, he's got to be doing it because he really have a love for black people and a love for white people. So as a, as a minister, he really did love all the American people, and he saw it as a, as a contradiction between brothers. So he was not like a black racist or a black nationalist. So he approached it as a Christian minister. So in that sense, I felt that it was a part of the, the historical... Um, uh, abolitionist movement. You know, I read a lot of Gundy's books, a lot of the uh, Quakers' movements, and I felt that I was a part of that stream of history that addressed the whole problem of oppression. Now, let me jump back to Selma. When you marched from Selma, finally arrived in Montgomery, Dr. King gave a very fine speech on the steps of the uh, the courthouse or the uh, Capitol at that time. How, how did that s speech feel for you? Because you've been talking about Dr. King's words. How, how did that speech seem to you that day? Was there something special about it? Um, well, not particularly in terms of his, his, his deliverance. Um, the speech in, in Montgomery was, was nothing like the opening speech for the campaign back in January that he'd made in Selma. I mean, where he really uh, preached in terms of laying out his intentions, where he really was like perfect as a preacher. But the uh, Montgomery movement was like a culmination of uh, a culminating of the, 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 the summary of, of where we were. And it was like I was pretty confident uh, based on the speech and based on what Johnson was saying that the basic work, the basic proposition that we would get the right to vote without a lot of problems, I was uh, confident that that would happen. Uh, but to me, that was not, say, one of his greatest speeches. The greatest speech to me was the speech that he made at Selma, I think, around January the 1st. After Selma, many things about the movement were never quite the same. SNCC sort of changed its philosophy within the coming years. So, and uh, in, in some ways, the, the energy disappeared. Did you feel that slipping away at that time? Did you sense that maybe you were at a turning point in the movement's history? Well, yeah, see, what happened... Is, it's not, to me, it's never the changing of a philosophy, it's the abandonment of a principle. What keeps the potency in a movement is the principle being applied and, uh, and applied to the need and the problem. Um, the need uh, at the time was for the, the blacks and, and whites in Alabama to be re-educated to participate in a democratic uh, government responsibly. And I had proposed that uh, we boycott Alabama and call for a new election. And in the proposal, it stated that the, the universities, like say Boston U, would take say Jefferson County, and each university would take a county and would engage in social education and political education, economic development education, which would cause the people to think uh, scientifically and academically about living in community rather than the age-old pattern of black and white. Uh, I lost that struggle within the movement, and uh, Jose Williams came up with a scheme called Scope, and, um, and King uh, got caught up in that and spent a half a million dollars, wasted time and money, in a scheme called Scope. And, and to me, that is what threw the movement off, because uh, we should have pursued uh, the educating of people so that they could functionally carry out good government from the precinct through the beats on up to the to the legislative districts and the, you know, in, in the counties. And, and, and to me, we failed the people when we didn't uh, complete, completely take them on to a, a, a process of democratic government. Uh, when King made that decision to put the staff and the money under the ausp auspices of Jose, I simply decided that I would come to Chicago and apply nonviolence to the whole question of open housing. So that's what I did. Sounds to me like you think the failing of the movement then was in the area of education. Uh, well, yeah, it's in the area of the application of nonviolence to what is the next problem. In other words, see, the movement is a dialogue, you know, and so you got to follow the logic of the dialogue. So you say, well, look, man, says now, I've taken my bath. The next move, put my clothes on. Well, now you got to put your clothes on because you finished your bath. Ain't nothing else to do. So you can't pretend like you haven't finished your bath and you didn't put your clothes on. So if we come to a point where the government says, okay, yeah, well, people can vote. Now the next step is, okay, now that the people can vote, 
then let's make sure we do what needs to be done so people can responsibly handle that vote. Now, if you don't follow through on that, then you're not going to get the kind of growth and strength and development and clarity and the lack of fear and the intimidation and the harassment and the age-old um, hostilities can be dissolved if you go through an educational process, see? And uh, I think when we didn't do that, I think we uh, let the people down. And